Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. This talk is about microservices and Nomeco, which is an open source library that you can use to write them in Python. My name is Matt Bennett. I'm the head of platform engineering at a company that's currently still in stealth mode, so I can't talk about it while I'm on camera. Um, and previously, I was a senior engineer at One Fine Stay, which is where Nomeco was, was born. So how many people in the room know the phrase microservices? OK, that's quite a lot. And how many of you knew about it two years ago? Not that many. So microservices is the hot new buzzword, and suddenly they seem to be everywhere. So quick history lesson. In November 2014, Martin Fowler and James Lewis published this paper, Microservices, which I think is considered to be the seminal paper on the topic. So I highly recommend it. It's very accessible. It's not very long, and there's a lot of information in there. And it's also very recent. So they didn't invent the term microservices, but they gave it a concrete definition and really propelled it into uh, our vocabulary. So at One Fine Stay, we discovered this paper when it was published and realized that it described what we'd been building for some time. And that was really exciting because suddenly we had a common language uh, with which to share ideas about this stuff. So for the uninitiated, what are microservices, or more correctly, what is the microservice architecture? So this is Martin Fowler's definition. It's an approach to developing a single application as a suite of small crucially, each running in its own process and communicating with lightweight mechanisms. So I think it's helpful to contrast microservices to a monolith which is probably your default way of building an application and as a single process. So your typical Django site is a good example. You would probably compartmentalize your logic into different apps in uh, Django parlance, but ultimately they would run in the same process and memory space as each other. Uh, whereas in microservices, your apps become entirely separate programs. So in essence, this is, a, uh, this is good old-fashioned decoupling and encapsulation, but applied at the process level. And so what this forces you to do is consider the, the boundaries of the services or the seams that run through, your, run through your application. A common response to the hype around microservices is you should be doing this anyway. You know, that's just good design, which is true. But with microservices, you, you can't be lazy and do, say, a cross-component import because it's not there to import. And there are other benefits to using separate processes as well. So some reasons for adopting microservices. The, the primary reason for adopting any software architecture is scale, or, or rather maintainability at scale. So I don't mean scale in terms of serving hundreds of millions of requests a second, but rather in the complexity of the problem that you're trying to solve and the team that is charged with solving it. So there's an analogy for this that Alan Kay, who is the inventor of small talk and object-oriented programming, used in a 1997 keynote, which I watched a video of because I was 13 in 1997. And it goes like this. So if somebody asked you to build a doghouse out of wooden planks and nails, you'd probably be able to do a reasonably good job, a reasonably sound structure. But if they asked you to then scale that up to 100 times the size using the same equipment and tools, it, you, you couldn't do it. The thing would collapse under its own weight. And so when society started building massive structures like cathedrals, we used stone arches to support the weight of the structure. And I had this light bulb moment where I realized that the etymology of the word architecture is literally the application of arches. So how can microservices help you achieve maintainability at scale? We've already said it's about decoupling and, enca and encapsulation, but what else? So as separate programs, they're independently deployable, 
which means you can have separate release cycles and separate deployment processes for each part of your application. So the Guardian newspaper have written about how they've embraced microservices, and it's allowed them to start using continual delivery in, in, and iterate very quickly in, to deliver one part of the application, but without putting uh, the, some slower moving or more legacy or more risky parts at risk. Separate programs are also independently scalable. So now I am talking about serving hundreds of millions of requests a second. So to scale a monolith, you have no choice but to replicate it and deploy another instance. You have to replicate the whole thing. But microservices are much more granular and therefore more composable. So if you have a service that is very highly CPU bound, you can deploy more of those across more CPUs without having to drag along the rest of your application as well. And there's also a freedom of technology. So being good Pythonistas, I'm sure we all really want to use Python 3 where we can. But sometimes we get stuck using an old library that hasn't been updated, you know, and therefore we can't. We're stuck in Python 2. With, in a monolith, you have to use the lowest common denominator. But microservices are individually free to use the most suitable interpreter for them. So Py2, Py3, PyPy, it's up to you. And I perhaps shouldn't say this too loudly at a Python conference, but this extends to your, late, your choice of language as well. So if you want to experiment with something functional like Haskell or Erlang, you can write a service in that language. And now, uh, forgive the circular reference on this one, but microservices are not monolithic. So outside the realms of software architecture, a monolith is something that's big and imposing and impenetrable. Think the, the monolith from 2001 Space Odyssey. Uh, whereas microservices are small and nimble and quick, they have a smaller code base, which means it's, it's easier to bring a new developer on board uh, and understand the whole thing. There's a lower cognitive overhead to understanding how it works, which is inherently more maintainable. And then there's Conway's Law. So uh, how many people have heard of Conway's Law? Yeah, a few. So this is something that ThoughtWorks talk about a lot. Uh, in, in 1968, a chap called Melvin Conway said this. Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. That was in 1968. It doesn't seem like there are any new ideas in software architecture. So in your, if you have your, your regular three-tiered web application, you have, uh, you have a database layer, and you have an application logic layer, and you have a user interface layer, and you likely employ specialists that, that work in those areas. So I've worked in a team like this, and as a member of the, of the middle tier, I would be able to, to talk, I would talk to my application developer peers every day, and it would be really easy for us to communicate. Uh, but then when we went to speak to the UI folks, we used this, you know, a subtly, slightly different language, and there was this layer of, layer of friction that meant, it, that meant that we made mistakes, and it was harder for us to communicate with them. And that's Conway's law in action. So what ThoughtWorks recommend instead is you build small multidisciplinary teams, and then you separate them based on the natural divisions that exist within the organization that you're serving. And as a result, you get an application that better reflects the organization rather than these somewhat arbitrary technical boundaries. So these wonderful benefits are all well and good, but what does it cost? Well, it's kind of a grown-up architecture. There are a lot of things that you have to have in place before you can make it work for you, uh, if you want to avoid the architectural doghouse. So there's a DevOps overhead. If you're increasing by 10 or 20 times or 100 times the number of things that need to be built and deployed and looked after, that's a massive burden for an operations team. And the only way to cope, really, is to leverage automation. So it, for your tests, for your deployment, for your machine management. 
And another insight from ThoughtWorks is that microservices are a post-CD architecture. And what they mean is that it's enabled by automation. And without automating your tests and deployment and machine management, that this burden would make microservices completely infeasible. And so I think this is why microservices all of a sudden seem to surround us. You know, it's the same good ideas of decoupling and encapsulation, but with this new dimension being enabled by, by DevOps tech. So as well as the DevOps overhead, you, you also have to embrace the domain in which you're operating. So you could argue that for a sufficiently complex application, you should really be doing this anyway, but I've certainly worked places that didn't. So what I mean uh, by domain knowledge is you, you have to really understand the business requirements, i.e. the problem that you are trying to solve for your organization. And you have to do that so that you know where to draw the lines between your services, how to divide your application up. You can't just build a web app and then tack things on as they become apparent. Microservices forces you to do, to do this up front. And then there's the decentralized aspect. So you no longer have a single source of, source of truth like the traditional database layer. You have to relinquish, that means you have to relinquish ACID guarantees and instead embrace BASE, which stands for basically available soft state, eventually consistent, which is a really awkward backronym, but a good chemistry joke. And so what this means uh, is that you can't apply transactions across calls to multiple services. You have to apply it in one place and then wait for those changes to be propagated and reflected in all the other places. That's eventual consistency. So at one fine stay, we made, we made a mistake in this, in this realm. We built uh, an abstract calendaring service that handled the data, the calendaring data and calls for several other services. And because they were, they were in separate, the calling service and the calendaring service were separate, we couldn't apply transactions across them, so, which is kind of a rookie error, really. But you know, what, what ended up happening was the calling service would write to the calendar, to call the calendaring service and write something to the calendar, which would succeed or fail. And if it succeeded, the calling service would then do something else. And if that something else failed, we had to catch it explicitly and then call the calendaring service to say, oh, just please undo the thing that we've just done to you. Uh, and, you know, we couldn't just roll back a transaction, transaction to achieve that. So that's an unnecessary loops that we forced ourselves to jump through. And of course, there's also the race condition where, you know, while the calendar has something in it that we end up, end up removing later, something else looks at the calendar and they see that it's free, it's full, but it, it should actually be free. So the decentralized aspect means you have to think about these things. And you have to be aware that you are building, you're introducing complexity. So a collection of microservices is fundamentally more complex than a monolith. There are more moving parts, and those moving parts are connected by a network, which is inherently less reliable than in-memory calls. So in a complex system, you know, in a complex system, failures rarely happen for exactly one reason. It's usually a cumulative effect of various soft failures adding up. So, you know, your network slows down in one area of your infrastructure, which causes a backlog of requests, which combined with a recent code change means you're writing some more to disk, which means that you run out of disk space. Uh, you know, and it's only when you get to the fourth or the fifth or the nth soft failure that you actually fall over. And to mitigate this, you need monitoring and telemetry, and you need analysis of the data that that produces so that when something goes wrong, you can figure out what it was, what caused it, or preferably you figure it out before it goes wrong. So by now you may be asking yourself whether microservices are right for you. And if so, here are some questions to consider. Is your code base large enough that no one person understands it? Are your dev and release cycles slow because of chains of dependent changes that need to be made? Do your tests take forever to run? If so, you might be fighting a monolith. 
And if that's the case, are you ready to support a distributed system? You know, do you, are you leveraging automation for your tests, deployment, and machine management? Uh, do you have sufficient monitoring and analysis in place to figure out what's going on inside it? So if your answers to these questions are yes and no, respectively, then fear not. Maybe you can build a multi-lift. So this is a term that I came up with yesterday, and so I'm not sure whether it will stick, but it serves the purpose for the, for the presentation. There is a sliding scale between uh, tens or hundreds of microservices at one end and a single monolith at the other. And this is a continuous, continuous spectrum. So you may choose to augment your existing monolith with one or two satellite microservices, the multi-lith. Uh, and this way, you get some of the benefits. Like you could choose to use a different interpreter, or you could try out CD you know, without most of the cost. So, Assuming we're all emboldened and ready to embrace microservices or a multi-lift, let me talk about Nameko. So it's an open source Apache 2 project, and it's a framework that is designed for writing microservices. We named it after the Japanese mushroom, which grows in clusters like this, and we thought it you know, kind of looked like microservices with many individuals making up the larger thing. Uh, so I asked a botanist friend of mine why they grew like that, and he shrugged and said, because there's not much room? Yeah, true story. So there's a couple of important concepts that I need to introduce uh, to explain some of the design principles in Nameko. Uh, there are entry points, which are how you interact with a service. So this is how you request something from it or otherwise get it to do something. Entry points are the interface or boundary of a service. And there are dependencies, which is how the service talks to something external to it that it may want to communicate with. So for example, a database or another service. So if we jump into some code, um, I put the, the code in the, in the following examples in a repo, so on GitHub, so you can grab them later if you want. Uh, Nameko service is written as a, as a Python class. So it has a name, which is declared with the name attribute, and it has some methods that encapsulate the, the, the business logic of the service. And then the methods are exposed by entry points. So this HTTP decorator here will call the greet method if you make a get request to that URL. So if I expand this example slightly, and let's pretend for a minute that string formatting is really expensive and we want to cache the greetings rather than generate them every time. Uh, I've also switched out the, the entry point, so now uh, it's a remote procedure call implementation as opposed to HTTP. So the first thing to notice is that the, the business logic of the, of the method is, is unchanged by switching out the entry points. You know, we've, we've added logic to deal with the cache, but it's entirely isolated from anything to do with HTTP or RPC. So in other words, uh, it's a declarative change that has no impact on the procedural code in the method. And the second thing to point out is that the cache is, implement, is, is added as a dependency. So this line here, cache equals cache client, is the declaration of a dependency. So dependencies are special uh, in the Mako. You, you declare them on your service class like this, but the class level attribute is different to the instance level attribute that the method sees when it executes. And that's because the dependency provider, which is our declaration, uh, the dependency provider uh, injects at the instance level attribute at runtime. So if we, if we hacked our, our method here to, to print these two attributes when, uh, when it runs, we'll see that, we'll see that, that, they, that they're different. So the first one here, the top one, cache client, 
is our dependency provider. And the second one is actually an instance of a memcache client object, and that's what the dependency provider injected. So using dependency injection like this uh, means that only the relevant interface gets exposed to the service method and the service developer. You know, all the plumbing of uh, managing a connection pool or handling reconnections is nicely hidden away inside the dependency provider. So this emphasis on entry points and dependencies also makes Namaco very extensible. All entry points and dependency providers are implemented as extensions to Namaco, even the ones that we ship with the library, which we include so that it's useful out of the box. But the intention is that you're free to and encouraged to build your own, or maybe through the wonders of open source, somebody will have already built it for you. So this is the list of um, built-in extensions. So the RPC decorator that we saw earlier is an AMQP-based RPC implementation that gives you a request-response type call over a message bus. There's also a publish-subscribe um, implementation that gives you asynchronous messaging over AMQP. And there's a timer for cron-like uh, cron -like things, and there's experimental WebSocket support. So I think it's worth explaining why we have this, this AMQP stuff in here. So um, HTTP is a natural starting place for microservices. There's a lot of great lightweight web frameworks out there. There's, uh, there's great tooling around, um, around API exploring and caching. And HTTP is ubiquitous. So, and you're probably going to need HTTP on the outside of your services so that clients can, can interact with it. But for service-to-service -service interaction inside your cluster of microservices where you control both sides, you probably want something other than HTTP. Um, in particular, PubSub is a killer app for microservices. There are all kinds of patterns for distributed systems that rely on asynchronous messaging with say, fan out capabilities and stuff. And AMQP is really great for that. So that's why we include it you know, out of the box. But you don't have to use it. Um, there are also some really great test helpers in, in Namaco. So we've already seen how injecting dependencies keeps the service interface clean and simple. But it also makes it really easy to pluck those dependencies out during testing. So uh, in this snippet here, we're using a helper called the Worker Factory, uh, which is really useful when unit testing services. So you pass it your service class, and it gives you back an instance of that service, but with its dependencies replaced by mock objects. So you don't need a real memcache server. And you can exercise your methods by you know, by calling them and then verifying that the mocks get called appropriately. The Worker Factory also has another mode of operation where you can, you can instead provide an alternative dependency. Uh, so in, in this case here, we're providing an alternative dependency and we're using the mock cache library, which um, you know, for, this, for this test has a much nicer interface. You know, we don't need to set up the return value or anything like that. So, uh, and there are, there are other helpers in, in Nameco for that do this kind of thing for, for integration testing, to help you with your integration tests, and that let you run services with mocked out dependencies or disabled entry points so that you can limit the scope of your integration to the, or the service interaction to the things that you actually want to test. So to summarize, in the microservices architecture, you split your application into services, which run as their own processes. And this is a way to achieve maintainability at scale so that you can build cathedrals of software. And it comes with a host of other benefits too, like freedom of technology, decoupled release cycles, even team structure, if you want, for each component part. But it's a grown-up architecture you know, it's co you're building a complex distributed system. 
at which means you need to automate your DevOps, and you need to monitor it, and you need to analyze the result of that monitoring. And you need to overall be aware that you are building a distributed system and on all of those distributed trade-offs. But you can also in, uh, adopt incrementally, you know, by adding one or two satellite microservices to your existing stack. And if you want to go on this microservices adventure, there's an open source library that can help you with it. So it's made for writing services, uh, encourages you to write clean, highly testable code. Uh, there are several built-in extensions, so it's useful out of the box, but it's designed to be extended to your use case. So if you want to know more, read the docs, fork the repo. And with that, thank you very much. Thanks for the talk. Uh, we finished a bit early, so there's lots of time for questions. Um, so, oh, I almost fall. Um, my question is, it seems that uh, there is uh, an implication that you migrate uh, stuff towards, from monolithic, uh, to a more um, microservice kind of ar architecture. Um, but is it a good idea to actually start doing um, microservices from the beginning? Um, is is a sound idea to try and so start I mean, something small? That's a that's a bold move, I would say. Um, so in the in that paper that Martin Fowler published, he. At the, right at the end, he, talk, he talks all about microservices, and then right at the end says, but you probably shouldn't start with microservices. Um, I, I think that probably depends on your prior experience, what, you know, what your, your roadmap is, you know, whether, you, um, whether you're starting from a blank slate or not. You know, it's kind of a trade-off. Hey, uh, thanks for the good presentation. Mm -hmm. um, is there a beginner uh, open source project that uses Namico that we can look at as a real world example? Yeah, that's a good question. So Namico is in, you know, heavily in use at One Fine Stay, which is closed source. Um, and there are a number of other smaller London startups that are starting to use it. I don't think there are any um, public open source applications that are using it yet. Hi. Um, it seems to me that LIMF that is going to be presented this afternoon uh, is very, very much similar. Do you, I mean, maybe it's a crazy idea, but why not try to take the, the best ideas of both and build something um, similar? Yeah, so I'm excited to talk to the guys from LIMF later. So we, oh, hi, hi. <laughs> um, we've had some email exchanges about stuff, and, you know, EuroPython is our opportunity to get together and talk about sharing some ideas. So I have a secondary question, which okay. is more technical, but um, is there a way, I mean, I looked at the API at the documentation this morning, and uh, it seemed pretty nice, but there's one thing that's missing that this, just a simple XML RPC of Python provides is the possibility to do introspection in the methods. You want to know what arguments are expected by a certain method. You want to have access to the doc string of the method. Mm -hmm. is there, and I couldn't find in the code or in the documentation if there was a way to do this with Namico. Well, so the, the entry point decorators, don't, they don't mutate the service methods. So you should be able to take your service class and inspect it like a, like a, regular, um, like a regular class and look at the doc strings of the methods that you've implemented in it. Yeah, you import your service class and inspect that. So you don't want to import in the on the client side. You don't want to import the service class because sometimes the service code will depend on many things, like I don't know, database interfaces sure, and whatnot. Yeah. So on the service on the client, you really do not want the service code. So you want to be introspecting on the client side. Yeah. Like at runtime. Yeah. Okay. Typically, so, what the XML RPC, uh, the simple XML RPC allows you to do, be this uh, 
uh, service.system.list uh, methods, for instance, or mm -hmm. whatnot. I mean, this is really useful for to develop a client yeah. independently of the service. So one thing that we have you know, bounced around for a while is the possibility of a client library where you can, from your service, you can export something that the client can then interact with. And otherwise, you're talking about shipping schemas over the wire, which is also a possibility. I think that's how XMRPC does it. Um, this, you know, I would put that in the category of fun extensions that you can add. You know, Numeco is actually quite a, a, quite a young library, certainly in the, as an op, as a open source project that's being uh, promoted. So there's a whole bunch of possibilities like this that you know, I hope that we get to. Uh, I would like to ask if uh, there is any ongoing efforts to uh, make a Apache Kafka interface as a message bus? So again, this is part of the extensibility. So we, we at one fine day, we used MQP very heavily, and so we built, and the, the built-in things we built because we needed them, and then we shipped them with the library because we think they're useful. But yeah, uh, using an alternative message bus or using you know, zero MQ or you know any any diff like alternative communication mechanisms falls squarely into the category of, you know, this is an extension. Let's build it. Let's build an entry point for it. Uh, and I hope that that's what what happens. Okay, so ba basically, right now there is uh, kind of. Are you building right now anything beyond what's been on the slides? Or yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's not Kafka. It's not Kafka. Okay. Right? <laughs> Sorry. Hi, thank you for the talk. Sure. Uh, just have a basic question. So when you go for a microservice architecture, so you need to be sure in advance that two services will never need to share memory in the future. Otherwise, it can be quite a large amount of work to merge them together, isn't it? Sure, yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks hi. for the talk. Um, it looks like one of the hardest things to do is uh, transactions. Do you have any suggestions on how to approach the problem? Not really. Uh, there's, transactions are a wonderful thing that, we've, that we have got used to, and you don't, you don't lose the ability to have, have atomic transactions in microservices, but it's within the scope of one individual service. So you, know, you need, that's why Dividing your application up is difficult because you need to make these decisions about, you know, where do you put these boundaries so that you can have atomic transactions in the places where it matters, and fall back to eventual consistency for other things. How you doing, Matt? Uh, great talk. Uh, I'm sure there's a few of us here in the room who are working on monoliths. Uh, do you have any uh, suggestions on how to approach? say, refactoring it into microservices? Yeah, go and for And what the, to watch out for? Go for the multi-list. Um, so this is exactly what happened at One Fine Stay. We, we built, this, um, we built this, this Django app, which is still our front end, and it accumulated all this logic about you know, bookings and payments and financial stuff. Uh, and it just became unwieldy. And so the journey started with, OK, let's take it was actually, let's take a piece that doesn't yet exist that we know is going to be really hard to add into this gigantic code base, and let's just build that as a separate thing. You know? So the, the first, you know, a, a good candidate for the first microservice is a new thing that you need to do. Make that separate, and then maybe you can identify another segment within your app that's you know, reasonably decoupled already, and then you can, you can move that out. It, you know, there's no, you, you can't really answer that question in, uh, in anything other than abstract. Hello. Uh, are there any situations where you wouldn't recommend to use uh, microservices? Any integrations? Uh, any situations where you wouldn't recommend it? Wouldn't recommend? Yeah, yeah, because, uh, I mean, you cannot use it for everything. Can you? So you, pr you probably don't need it if, you're, uh, if you're a developer team is, you know, two or three people. Strong. Um, you definitely don't want, you shouldn't do it if you're not prepared to support the distributed system aspect of it. Um, if you don't have automation in place you know, for, your, for your DevOps. 
uh, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a big commitment. So you, you only really want to start going down this road when you know that you've got the, the relevant things in place, because otherwise you come unstuck pretty quickly. Hello. Uh, have you tried doing uh, using Namico on platform as a service? That's one thing. And uh, how do you approach uh, like configuration? I see that you uh, declare a service, but right. where is the services sure. configuration taken from? So on on platforms in platforms of a service, I think there's too many there's too much recursion there for me to get my head around what <laughs> what we're offering. Um, but let me come back to that uh, on the um, on the on the config stuff. Yeah, so I didn't I didn't show it, but you can provide on the command line a, a YAML file to that contains your config, and then dependencies have access to that config. So you can I excluded it for simplicity, but you would probably specify the uh, the config key to look up for say the memcache location when you declare your dependency, and then it would know to go and read that element of the config file. So if, if you look at the code on GitHub, I've, I've done that. Okay. Uh, do you maybe have a, a kind of an environment variable parser, like for 12-factor apps that are configured through environment vari variables? No, not yet, but. Okay. And last question, how do you run your services, like with Gunicorn uh, or with MicroWizG? With, or do, so do there's, they a, there's a command line interface in, in the Mako. Uh, and then we just run that behind with supervisor. Hi. So I've already been using Namico, and I was wondering if there's any interest in doing a sprint this weekend on Namico. Yeah, totally. So I'm, I fly out on uh, Saturday night, but all of Saturday. Let's okay. Do it. I'm up for that as well. Cool. Hi, I always wonder how micro should be the microservices. <laughs> it's a bit it's a bit unfair to compare to 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 compare only against the monolith. And yes. as you said before, it's it's just a, it's a good architecture if you have components. So you said you should do microservices if a single person cannot keep the whole code in his mind, but well if you split it up into medium-sized services that still fit into a human brain, well, so as I said, opposed to having basically every route of your Django configuration as its own service, I find that a bit, I, I don't know where where is the limit. Right. So that doesn't that doesn't seem like a good idea. Uh, the term microservices is actually kind of unhelpful because it implies a size, which I don't think really I don't think really applies. I mean, at one point today, we perhaps didn't make all of the decisions correctly about how you know how to divide our application up. But we had some services that were minuscule, you know, just a couple of methods. And we had others that were, you know, could only just fit in somebody's brain, you know, thousands of lines. Um, so it's an unhelpful classification. You, you know, you, it's very unlikely that you'd end up with lots of services that are all the same size, you know. Uh, so, yeah, the, picking the granularity, deciding where to draw the lines, that's, that's the hard bit, really. Um, you've talked about uh, built-in extensions. Um, can you extend? Can I, can I extend uh, and write my own extension? Like, if I want to support the protocol. Yeah. So, um, what, so what was your what was the example right at the end? What was the what was the suggestion right at the end? The last thing the thing you actually wanted to build? Uh, I don't know, like support the middle protocol. Okay. Yeah. So yes, you can. Um, you absolutely can. So en entry points are harder to write because there's a bit more machinery, but the but dependencies are pretty easy. So if you so um, if you want to talk to a different type of database, for example, that's easy. If you want to send a message uh, or put a message in SQS, it's, it's a relatively easy thing to do. Does anybody have any more questions? Oh, there's one. Yeah, you mentioned some of the key points to go into, or the hard points to go, when you go into microservices and the DevOps. And one of the things you said you have to have in place is really good monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, have you considered covering some support in Nameco for having some sort of 
approach to monitoring? Right, so, <clears throat> so what the thing we used at, at One Fine Stay, which worked extremely well, was, uh, was we used uh, Logstash and Elasticsearch. So every time an entry point fired, we would dispatch a message, stick it on a queue that would be ingested by Logstash and put in Elasticsearch, and then we used Kibana to explore the data. So you could see you know, what, which methods got called, and then through the call stack, you could see which methods called them, and which arguments were, and which ones generated errors, and how long they took, and what size the payload was, and you could build all sorts of cool graphs so that you get different, you can see spikes and explore it. And that worked really well. So that didn't get open sourced um, before, I, before I changed jobs. So I'm currently in the process of, of re-implementing that, and that will become one of the first um, open source things. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so if there are no more questions, please thank Matt.